Chapter 22. You can run, but you can't hide. Wake up. They're coming. It's the lion. He's causing a stampede. Silas ran to get his parents before the beasts could tear through their cabin and trample them. The noise outside from thousands of hooves pounding the ground had become deafening. What? What's wrong? A groggy voice called from the sofa. Dad struggled to wake up. How can he sleep through this? Silas wondered as he dashed over to the sofa. He could feel the floorboards vibrating under his bare feet. Even the walls were rattling now. In fact, everything was shaking, almost like there was an earthquake. Wake up! Silas yelled. The stampede! We have to run for it! The what? Dad said, hobbling up and hopping on his good leg. Outside! Follow me! Silas led his dad onto the porch to show him. Dad hopped after him at, on one leg, half asleep. Look, out there, Silas started, but then he trailed off. His mouth dropped open in shock. He scanned the terrain. It was silent. No, this can't be, he said incredulously. The Pride Lands were deserted. No stampede, no wildebeest. No hooves pounding at the ground. No dust cloud. Nothing was damaged. It all looked completely normal. Silence clung to the chilly night air. In fact, the only strange thing was how silent it was. Usually, if it wasn't the coyotes howling, the screech owls took up their nightly cries to startle their prey from the underbrush and out into the open. They were just here, Silas said. I swear it. Hundreds of them. Who was here? Dad said in confusion. The wildebeest. Silas trailed off, realizing how ridiculous that sounded. Dad looked around, still disoriented from being woken up in the middle of the night. His brows knitted together in annoyance. Silas, is this some kind of prank? No. They were here. I swear. That was when a terrible noise pierced the still night air. <clears throat> George woke up in a furious fit of crying. Silas cringed back. Just great. And now you woke the baby, Dad muttered. Do you know how hard it is to get him to sleep? Your poor mother needs to rest. Silas shrank back. He wished he could get smaller like Ant-Man. Or better yet, turn invisible. The guilt ate at him like a rodent chewing through the insulation in the walls. That happened once at their house in Florida. Well, that was what his stomach felt like. Dad shook his head in disappointment. Son, what's gotten into you lately? You haven't been acting like yourself ever since we moved here. What's going on? Silas looked down at his feet. Yeah, it just was a bad joke, he lied. I'm really sorry. He couldn't admit the truth, that he would have sworn on his life that there was a stampede. He could still remember the terrible noise, like rumbling thunder that didn't fade out but only grew louder. The way their hoofs kicked up dust that floated above them like dark clouds. And the smell, dust and sand and sweat and panic, an unforgettable aroma. And worse, how their eyes glowed unnaturally with emerald light. They galloped as if someone, or something, was behind them, whipping them into a terrible frenzy. But had something truly been there? He shook his head in confusion. Either he'd imagined it, and all the other crazy things that had been happening, or something supernatural was going on. Not that it mattered. His father would never believe him. It was better to pretend that it was a joke gone awry. Fine, go back to bed, Dad said in a calm voice. It would have been better if he yelled. This serious voice was far more terrible. We'll talk about it in the morning. Silas did as he was told, feeling worse than ever. He walked back to his room in shame, serenaded by his brother's wailing. He knew what he had seen, but he couldn't explain it. Especially why it had vanished and his father hadn't been able to see it, too. It felt like he was being haunted. But that was impossible. 
His eyes darted to the closet. The door was ajar. He crept over and checked the chest. It was still there, locked tight. He grabbed the staff and waved it over the trunk. But nothing happened this time. The staff remained dark, and the lid remained shut. He tried again, gringing back, but again. Nothing unusual happened. No ghostly lion, no strange voice. He ran his fingers over the lock, feeling for a lever. And it opened at his, at his touch, his heart still pounding like those ghostly hooves. He cracked open the chest and froze. But it was all as he left it. The dusty lion pelt lay at the bottom. He breathed a, breathed a sigh of relief and shut the lid. His hands swam with confusion. The strange vision of the stampede felt fresh, like a nightmare that didn't fade with waking but rather grew stronger. He could smell it and hear it and feel it, but he couldn't explain it. As he thought back through everything, he could trace the origin back to when Archie bestowed the staff upon him and he opened the trunk for the first time. He could still remember the ghostly lion and his menacing voice. Could he be behind all the hauntings? But even as he thought about that, he felt ridiculous. Nobody would ever believe him. Worse, he dreaded the lecture that he was going to get from his father the next day. He wondered if there would be a punishment, like getting grounded or losing his phone. The idea of not being able to message Jose and Tamara upset him. But then he realized something. The last time they'd written to each other was two days ago. Their last bubbles glowed in pink and blue, but remained unanswered. Silas felt guilty. They were already losing touch, and it hadn't even been that long. Akuna Matata, he muttered softly. He typed that into the text bubble and hit send. But even those words didn't cheer him up. He returned to bed and sank into a dark, dreamless sleep for once. But it was almost worse, because it felt like the sleep of the dead. Luckily, his father saw the mournful expression on his face when Silas awoke and padded on out of his room, so he went easy on him. Better yet, no grounding for life or, worse, from electronics. But no more practical jokes, Dad said in his stern vo dad voice. That little prank with the staff and Archie was funny, but like anything, it could be annoying or even dangerous if taken too far. What happened last night can never happen again, got it? Sorry, I promise it won't happen again, Silas said, trying to look as contrite as possible to lessen any looming punishment. He was lucky that Mom wasn't involved this time. Then he would have been grounded for sure and probably lost his phone. His dad let him off the hook with only a warning. Next time, your phone, he said, nodding to it. It chimed as if on cue lighting up with texts from his friends replying to his Akuna Matana message. By now, they knew what that camp slogan meant. Oh, it's Jose and Tamara, Silas said, showing his father the screen. Dad's face softened, knowing how much his old friends meant to him. Glad you're keeping in touch with them. Even more reason to be on your best behavior, Silas finished for him. He'd heard that a million times. It always made him worry that his best behavior would never be good enough for his parents or anyone else. And how did you qua quantify best and even? Probably with fractions, or worse, algebra. He wasn't sure what that was exactly, only that it was something terrible that happened to you around 8th grade. He was already dreading it. Dad said that he was skipping breakfast that morning to catch up on sleep. Mom had been up late with the baby, so they were finally both resting. Silas felt guilt, guilt stab at him again. He wandered down to the mess hall by himself, his boots padding over the fresh gravel. It was late, past breakfast, but he hoped to scrounge up some leftovers to tide him over to lunch. He swept his gaze over the pride lands, taking in the beauty of his austere la landscape. So different from Orlando, the vision of the stampede, the thousands of eerie green eyes charging over the messes, 
driven into a violent frenzy by the ghostly lion chasing them, hit him full force. He let out a shocked gasp, but then the vision vanished again, just as quickly as it had appeared. He blinked in the bright sunlight, remembering how his dad said it chased bad dreams away. Not this one, Silas muttered under his breath. His heart pounded faster, making him sweat and breathe harder at the same time, ready to fight. But how could you battle back against something that you weren't sure was even there? He remembered how afraid everything made him. It was more like, run for your life. He didn't risk another look back, but hurried to the mess hall. He pushed open the door, smelling the lingering aroma of pancakes and bacon. Now he regretted oversleeping and missing out on hot breakfast. But then he heard a voice echoing out from the kitchen. Oh no, how did he get out? It was Timothy, and he sounded really upset. He was back in his family's little apartment. Silas heard some more anguished cries, accompanied by banging around. Then Timothy burst into the mess hall. Natasha was hot on his heels. What's wrong? Silas asked. Zazu is missing, Timothy cried. Someone must have broken in and let him out of his cage. We discovered him missing this morning. Or you forgot to latch it, Natasha said accusingly. You're always forgetting things. Yeah, things that don't matter, like verb conjug conjugations and fractions. Not this. You sure you latched it, Natasha said. I always double check, Timothy said, just in case. Last night, Silas said. Remembering the ghost well, will be stampede. Lots of bad things had happened the previous night. He wondered if Zazu had also heard the stampede. They both spotted the look on his face. What about last night? Natasha said, narrowing her eyes. What aren't you telling us? Yes, Silas, what is it? Timothy said, fixing him with a direct gaze. Look, if you know anything that can help us find Zazu, then you have to tell us, even if it's crazy. Silas glanced around the mess hall, which was empty right then. He, he was worried they wouldn't believe him, but then he thought of poor Zazu. He lowered his voice. Just that, a lot of strange things have been happening around here lately, he whispered. I wonder if something more is going on, he trailed off uncertainly. What do you mean, Timothy asked. Uh, yeah, like what, Natasha added. Well, the accident for starters... My dad falling off the bridge and getting hurt. Ever since then, I've been seeing things, well, that aren't really there. Now Zazu is missing. Like ghosts? Natasha gasped. Or specters? Timothy said. They're the same thing, Natasha said, rolling her eyes. But yeah, like that? They both peered at him expectantly. Silas nodded. I think I saw my aunt's ghost in here yesterday. She came alive in one of the pictures over there. Well, I think she was asking me for help. Help? Natasha repeated, thinking that over. Oh, sometimes when spirits don't pass on, they need help to figure out what happened to them. Uh, I saw it in a movie once. Yeah, a dumb movie called Ghosts, Timothy said with a wince. That mom made us watch. It wasn't even scary. It was funny. To what a total ripoff. In the movie... Natasha went on, ignoring him. Someone gets killed, and then he comes back as a ghost so that his wife can help find whoever did it. Ugh, you left out all the gross kissing parts, Timothy said, making a gagging face. He leaned towards Silas. There was a lot of, he said, and made kissing noises. Silas smirked, but then they all turned more serious in, as it sank in that somehow weird might be happening at the camp. Haunting it, even. Like in that movie. Maybe, Silas said. I still don't know that much about how my aunt died. But there's more. And it's going to sound really weird. I'm worried that you won't believe me. He trailed off and looked down. They were his only real friends here. He didn't want to lose them. He liked Archie and Raffi and Sarah. But they were all, but they were grown-ups and didn't exactly count as friends. But the twins shook their heads adamantly and in unison, as only twins could. If it helps us find Zazu, you have to tell us, Natasha said. Right, your aunt loved him, Timothy added. She would want us to help him. 
Silas hesitated, but then he forced his words out. He told them everything about finding the chest in his closet, then using the staff to release the ghostly lion from it. A what? Timothy said. They exchanged a look. What else can you tell us about it? Natasha added, clearly swooped. Well, he had these glowing green eyes, Silas said, and he talked in a fancy voice with an accent. It sounded it sounds weird, but he had manners. He also said that someone locked him away. The twins both looked alarmed by that. They glanced over at the wall. Silas followed their gaze down the row of photographs to an empty spot next to the grand opening picture. Then his eyes widened. How had he ev never noticed it before? Clearly another picture used to hang there, but it had been taken down. However, the outline of the missing photograph had been bleached into the wall by the sunlight streaming through the windows. What is it? Silas said, feeling uneasy. What aren't you telling me? Finally, Natasha spoke, but in a hushed voice. Are you talking about... Scar?